So quick review. In our study of Genesis, we've gone through the creation, the fall, observed the lives of Cain who killed Abel, uh, Lamech who boasted that he was more hardcore than Cain, uh, and then we had the Nephilim, which culminated in the flood, <clears throat> and then the reboot of man, right, through Noah. And after exiting the ark, they were given direction. In Genesis 9, 1, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. After that, we saw Noah retiring as a naval architect and trying his hand at a second career as a vintner. That's a winemaker. He was also a wine taster, apparently. That career ended most inauspiciously and led to Noah's curse on Ham's son, Canaan, his progeny, anyway, and due to Ham's, and that was due to Ham's indiscretion, which Chuck talked about last time. That curse was Genesis 9, 24. Cursed be Canaan, servant of servants, he shall be to his brethren. Okay, and then we're on to chapter 10. Okay, so chapter 10 is referred to as the table of nations. <clears throat> it's here that we identify the post-flood people groups through three genealogies, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. There's a temptation to skip over them because the genealogies, you know, they're, the names are unfamiliar and they're difficult to pronounce, but, but there's a few reasons that we should not do that and encourage us to, to slog our way through it. <clears throat> Genealogies are solid evidence that the Bible can be trusted. Just like Ronald Reagan said, they're signing the Intermediate Range Nuclear uh, Forces Treaty. He said, we'll trust, but verify, right? So genealogies are the verification. They're specific, unlike myths and fables. They're personal, they're real people, real events, real places. They're familial. The inheritances are passed down based on, based on whose the people are, not who the people are. And those tribal names are used by the prophets <coughs> to, I just jumped all the way to the end. Prophets like Ezekiel, Isaiah, Jeremiah, they use those tribal names to prophesy later on. Ezekiel 38 is a good, uh, good example. Son of man, set your face toward Gog of the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him. It goes on to say in Persia, mentions Persia, Cush and Put are with them. So, I mean, if you're a student, that might not drive you nuts. But if you're not, that will uh, cause you to go, I don't care. Go on. So that cheat sheet will help you figure out where these people are. Genesis 11. We'll see God's merciful handling of another of man's efforts to seek a name for himself, independent of God's hands. And as a bonus, or maybe a warning, uh, we'll get a glimpse of the efforts of the first world dictator, apparently a model for future dictators. And then we get another genealogy. Okay. But this genealogy in, in chapter 11 is, it lays out a God-ordained and deliberate path toward the redemption of the nation. From Noah through Shem to Peleg and on to Abram, who's promised early in Genesis 12 that his offspring would be a blessing to all nations. And this offspring, as we see from the genealogies in Matthew and Luke, will lead to Christ. Okay. That being said, there isn't time to talk about everybody, so I've provided you a cheat sheet. And I'll stay primarily at the, level, the first level of the sons and elaborate on those that I think might either help illuminate interesting facts in the Genesis history or just because I find them interesting. Okay. So we're going to do this in three in four sections, basically. The first section will be the three genealogies, generations of son, uh, generations of the sons of Noah. Uh, then the dispersion, Genesis 11, and the Tower of Babel event. And then the second genealogy of Shem, and then another dispersion. But this one's a different type. Okay, so Genesis 10, 1 to 5. <clears throat> okay. These are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Sons were born to them after the flood. The sons of Japheth, Gomer, Magog, Madai, Javan, Tubal, and Meshech, and Tiras. We'll actually just stop there. So according to Josephus, one of my sources, and maybe not the best in the world, but he's pretty good, the sons of Japheth inher inherited the earth. Next slide. <clears throat> Okay, in the red there, that's where the sons of Japheth went. Okay, beginning of the mountains of Taurus and Aminus. If you, you see the square there, just go up 
uh, right in the corner where, um, where Turkey meets, where it says Hamathites. That's where the, um, the Taurus Mountains are. And if, if you curve down to the south, that's the Aminus Mountains. So right in there, they spread out from there to Asia up to, it's called the Tanzas in, in, uh, in Josephus, but it's actually the Don River. Uh, which is, you can't see it on there, but if you go north, you'll hit the Baltic Sea, and uh, it's, or the Black Sea, pardon me, and it's up in the corner, the, the right-hand corner, northeast corner. And then from there, all the way over to Spain, in a place called Cadiz, so that's Japan. Okay. Now, one thing I want to say is, these maps, they're not perfect. Um, they're a snapshot in time. Things change, people migrate, and wars happen, and things like that, so... This is a snapshot on in time. Um, okay. Okay, so I wanted to, s to focus on Javan because one of his offspring pops up a lot in the scriptures. Javan was a predecessor of the Ionians and became the Greeks from the cheat sheet. And I want to talk about Tarshish real quick. And you have it there also, but uh, I wanted to kind of verbalize it. Tarshish is mentioned, it's referred to in Chronicles, in Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Jonah. Uh, Ezekiel 27, 12, Tarshish was your trading partner because of your abundant wealth of every kind, and they exchanged silver, iron, tin, and lead for your merchandise. So apparently Tarshish is referred to as a land of plenty with raw materials. The inhabitants became traders, must have had seafaring skills, because uh, the best way to get there was by sea. And though the actual location remains a mystery, we can draw a couple of conclusions. First, it's, the term's used as the farthest ends of the earth. So it could be Tartusis in Spain, but it could also be in Britain, Britannia, because that term has to do with a land uh, that's got a lot of tin. But wherever Tarsus is, it's not on the way to Nineveh. You should, you should get that. Okay, remember Jonah, he was going to Nineveh, but I don't want to go to Nineveh, I'm going, yeah, okay, Tarshish. Okay, 10.5, we're going to jump to 10.5 now. By these were the isles of the Gentiles divided in their lands, everyone after his tongue, after their families, and in the nations. The term isles of the Gentiles, you can find that in Esther, uh, and Esther 10 and Ezekiel 26. Um, there's a comparable term, isles of the sea. It's a reference to Asia Minor, which is also known as Turkey, uh, and the whole of Europe, especially along the coasts of the Western Med with, with their islands. And sometimes the term refers, to directly, refers directly to Cyprus. And then everyone after his tongue. So prior to the episode at Babel, everyone had a common language. You find that in Genesis 11, verse 1. Some say it was Hebrew. Genesis 11 explains how the different languages came about. So Genesis 11 is an amplification of Genesis 10. Okay, it's not chronologically, um, it doesn't go chronologically. Just like Genesis 2 expands on the last part of Genesis 1. Okay, next slide. Okay, this was... Okay, that's good. So that gives you another feel for the different groups. I'll leave that up for a second. Okay, now we're going to talk about the sons of Ham in 10.6. Uh, I'll specifically talk a little bit about Cush, Mizraim, and Canaan. And the sons of Ham, Cush, and Mizraim, and Put, and Canaan. Uh, okay, Ham, Ham means black, hot, burnt, or to be hot. Uh, the sons of Ham populated Africa, the Middle East, Palestine, Israel, and to the Far East. And the terms found in the Bible, when you see the land of Ham, generally they're talking about Egypt. 10.7, uh, and the sons of Cush, Seba, Havla, Sabta, Rama, Sabtika, and the sons of Rama, Sheba, and Dedan, Saudi Arabia. And I mention that because there's a strange interruption in the midst of the genealogy of Cush, or the sons of Cush. So it must be important, but we're not really told why until later. Um, and that talks about Nimrod, but real quick, Mizraim. Mizraim is another word for the union of upper and lower Egypt. And it's used throughout the Bible, so when you see that, that's what it means. 
The other interesting thing about Mizraim is among his offspring were the Philistines. And there's a group today that came from the Philistines who are known as the Palestinians. So the Palestinians are Egyptian. Okay. Hmm? Amen. Amen, brother. There you go. So, okay, so Genesis 10, 8, and 9. And Cush begot Nimrod. He began to be a mighty warrior on the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel and Eric and Akkad and Kelna, Kelna in the land of Shinar. Okay, interestingly, Nimrod's not mentioned as a son of Cush. Well, at least I thought it was interesting. He's not mentioned as a son of Cush in verse 7, but he is mentioned in an offhand way as having been begotten by Cush. That's probably a study for a different day. Okay, Babel. Babel becomes Babylon. Okay. So aside from Nimrod, five of its kings were named in the Bible. Among them was Merodach Baladan in 2 Kings 20 and Nebuchadnezzar, the second destroyer of Jerusalem. 2 Kings 24. Okay, so we're going to move on and I'll come back to Nimrod when it is appropriate. Okay, so Genesis 10, we're jumping to Genesis 10, 15 now. Uh, sons of Canaan. Canaan fathered Sidon, firstborn, and Heth, and the Jebusites, Amorites, Girgashites, Hivites, Archites, and Sinites, the Arvidites, the Zemorites, the Hamathites, and on and on and on. So when you when you going through the Bible and see the ites, unless it's Israelites, there's a good chance it's one of the Canaanite tribes. Okay, Canaanite term refers to a specific tribe, but it also can refer to all of them collectively, and many times it does. We already talked about Genesis 9, where cursed be Canaan. Genesis 17, 8, the promise to Abraham, and I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession. There's a promise right there. Okay, Joshua 3.10. This is about a thousand years later. <clears throat> Ish. And Joshua said, here's how you will know that the living God is among you and that he will without fail drive out from before you the Canaanites, the Hittites, they came from Heth, the Hivites, Perizzites, Girgashites, etc., etc. <clears throat> All of these are descendants of Ham, the curse. Cain and Canaan, consequently. Okay, let's go to slide four and five. Okay, this looks strange, but um, I'll, I'll get to the point. In case you uh, run into someone who's like, oh, that's not fair, why should Canaan be cursed and you know, Abraham gets a promise, and, and they just come in and throw them all into the Palestine, the Gaza Strip, and then just, that's just not fair. Okay. In case we lean towards that regarding Canaan's descendant, descendants, let's consider what was happening in the land of Canaan. The land of Canaan was situated on a land bridge between Asia, Africa, and Europe. You can kind of see that, right? You can see where Israel is in there. It's, it's an intersection. That was coveted by the powers of the day. The small city-states were controlled by the larger surrounding nations. And in the centuries previous to Joshua's invasion, they were controlled by the Egyptians, the Hittites, and the Assyrians. And later, the Babylonians, the Persians, the Greeks, and then the Romans. And their religion revolved around a pantheon of gods introduced by these occupying powers. There's El, Asherah, Baal, uh, along with their local deities. Uh, these were key, key figures of uh, worship. Syncretism, that's the combining of elements of different religions. That was big there <clears throat> and was common and included idols, prostitution, and human sacrifice, child sacrifice as well. So the Canaanites lived there for about a thousand years after the curse was rendered and immersed themselves in idol worship, child sacrifice, and lots of other no-nos. All right. Moving on to Shem, verse 21. 
And the children were born to Shem, the father of all the children of Eber, the brother of Japheth, the elder. The children of Shem, Elam, Asher, Arphaxad, Lud, and Aram. Okay, so he had five sons. Elam probably doesn't sound familiar, but that was, the word means high, and it was, we know them as the Persians. Okay, or Iran. So the Iranians aren't Arabs. Okay, they're Persians. Uh, Asher. Asher, again, a Shem son, actually founded the Assyrians. He lived in Nineveh. And that's Nineveh's northern Iraq, north of the Tigris. Arphaxad. Arphaxad became the Chaldeans. Arphaxadites ended up being the Chaldeans. We know somebody who's uh, fairly of interest who came from Chaldea. We'll hit that in a little bit. Another strange comment in the midst of the genealogies uh, regards the earth being divided during Peleg's lifetime. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, so when you see these things like Nimrod and the earth divided, you don't know why it's there. We're well, going to find out later on if you just hang on. Okay, 1024 to 31. I, I'm not going to read all of it, but our facts said begot Selah. Selah begot Eber. Eber was the predecessor of the Hebrews. We're, uh, to Eber were born two sons. The name of one was Peleg, for in his day the earth was divided, and his brother's name was Joktan. Joktan like ten sons. Um, so it, it's interesting that that genealogy actually followed. It's talking about Shem. He goes through to Eber to um, uh, Joktan and then goes down and leaves Peleg alone for now. We'll come back to him because that second genealogy found in Genesis 11 is where you pick up Peleg. Okay. Peleg means divided. Some believe this is a reference to the continental drift and some call it Pangaea, some call it Godwana land and you know, all the, all the Earth's crusts kind of look like they form together. Could be, um, but other people say that, no, it's, it's because the people were divided geographically after, after the um, confusion of the languages. I'm going to go with that. That makes the most sense to me. Uh, I think that if there was a, a fast shift, we'd read about that somewhere else. And um, <clears throat> anyway, we'd hear more about it. So, okay, now, now we're going to move into Genesis 11, and we'll see that amplification I was mentioning earlier that, um, where it talks about according to their languages and for in his days the earth was divided. Slide 8. I might have missed slide 7. Okay, yeah, well, sorry. There's slide 7. Let's stick there for a second. You can see our facts said, Sela, Eber. Eber has two sons, and this first... This first genealogy went to Joktan. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Okay, so we're back to that for some reason. That's slide eight. Okay, yeah, there we go. Let's just leave that one. Okay, Genesis 11, one through four. Now the whole earth had one language. Again, some people think it's Hebrew. And one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east they found a plain in the land of Shinar. The, this, the plain is between the Tigris River and the Euphrates River. You see the two blue lines that kind of come together? That's the Tigris and Euphrates. Um, and, and the Bible says that they came from the east. So all I can tell you is Mount Ararat is not exactly to the east. It's sort of to the north. So they might have followed a, a mountain range down and then hooked over. So that might be the answer to that. I'm not sure. Okay. They found a plain in the land of Shinar, which is modern-day Iraq, and they dwelt there. And then they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They had brick for stone, and they had asphalt for mortar. And they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the, over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down and to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. 
And the Lord said, indeed, the people are one and they have one language. And this is what they begin to do. My emphasis. I don't know how the emphasis was supposed to go. Now, nothing they propose to do will be withheld for them. Also could be rendered or impossible for them. So this occurred about 100 to 200 years after the flood, during the time of Peleg. You, know, you got to do the math. And about 100 to 200 years after the flood, as the civilizations were restored, and when the idea and the work began on the Tower of Babel. Interestingly, Genesis 11 doesn't even mention the leader's name. But writings from the Babylonians, the Persians, and the Assyrians do. What we can observe from those verses. There was one language, okay? So it happened sometime during Genesis 10, as we're told, and it was during Peleg's lifetime. They found a lush plain and dwelt there. What were they supposed to do? They're supposed to fill the earth. They had brick and asphalt for mortar. Okay, there were no stones in this area. There's a lot of stones in the land of Canaan, but there's not a lot of stones over here. There's a lot of mud. It's between two rivers, right? It's a... It's a pretty lush plain. Uh, so brick and asphalt for mortar was a giant leap in building technology, like the wheel or the steam engine for transportation, like the telegraph for communication, the light bulb, the integrated circuit, Cool Ranch Doritos. You know. Okay, there's a lot of things people can do with or without technology, but not everything that can be done should be done. For example, cloning people might be a really bad idea. Okay. Water skiing on your feet, probably a bad idea. And something that should definitely not be done is ice dancing. Don't do that. Okay. Ice dancing, no. Or curling. Okay, why a tower? They wanted to make a name for themselves. For some reason, there's part of all of us that would like us to be remembered. And there's nothing really wrong with that. But when it gets to the point of building monuments in our names, in our names, I don't think George Washington said, I want a monument, I want a big pencil in DC. Okay. <clears throat> some buildings, some people build buildings, put their names on them, Trump Tower. Uh, we build streets, we put names on them. Today there's a lot of attention being paid to personal brands. Is that wrong or is that good business? If all the effort focused on elevating oneself is on elevating oneself in man's eyes, it's probably not a good thing. Maybe good for business, but not really good for humility. Okay, so we're going to flash back now to Genesis 10, 9, and 10, where Cush has begotten Nimrod. Talk about him for a little bit. The name Nimrod means rebel or the rebel, and he was a mighty hunter before the Lord, but the term before is actually rendered in defiance of the Lord. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel and three other cities in the land of Shinar. So Nimrod was a legend in the world's eyes, leading a rebellion against God at Babel and creating or attempting to create the first worldwide government. In fact, I'm told by Matt that um, archaeologists unearthed an, an incredible artifact that he managed a great peril to himself and his iPhone to snap a picture of. Next slide. <clears throat> Yes, you saw it here first, the Nimrod action figure. Believe it or not, that is a real thing. Okay, so here's how Josephus describes Nimrod and the events at Babel. Now it was Nimrod who excited them to such an affront and contempt of God. He was the grandson of Ham, the son of Noah, a bold man and of great strength of hand. He persuaded them not to ascribe their happiness to God as if it were though his mean as if it were through his means they were happy, but to believe that it was their own courage which procured that happiness. He also gradually changed the government into tyranny, seeing no other way of turning men from the fear of God, but to bring them into a constant dependence on his own power. That reminds me of something that happened recently, but, and has happened in government, trying to get us to rely on them a little bit more. Um, Okay, so what was God's response? Genesis 11, 7 and 9. Come, let us go down and confuse their language that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad 
and from there over the face of all the earth. And they ceased building the city. Therefore, its name is called Babel, because the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of the earth. So Babel means a confusion of sounds or voices. Obviously, we get the word Babel from. And so God, rather than destroying man again, he responds to man's arrogance with patience and restraint. And in the book of Revelation, we find that God's response will not be quite as restrained later on. And then we come to another genealogy for Shem. So what's this all about? And we discover there is more to God's response than confusing the language. In fact, it was a preemptive strike to save man. In, in, Shem, in, Shem, Shem, in Shem's second genealogy, we'll track through Peleg through several more generations until we arrive, arrive at one particular man, a pagan idolater in the land of Ur of the Chaldeans, who will answer the call in Genesis 12. So let's go and hit Shem's descendants. I'm going to hit these from a pretty high level. Um, I'm just going to summarize Genesis 11, 10 to 32. Okay, so we have our facts add, our facts, and, this, and I'll tell you how old they are, just to make it easy for you. Our facts sad was 600, Selah 438, Eber 433, Peleg, the division, 464, Ru 239, Sirug 230, Nahor 148, Tira 205. Uh, so, and from Tira, you have Abram, Nahor, and Haran. So notice the, um, the declining age um, expectation. Um, that was dictated in Genesis 6. I believe it's 6.3. Don't quote me. Somewhere in Genesis uh, where God said that man's days would be 120 years. <clears throat> so it's interesting when he says things are going to happen like if you eat this fruit, you will surely die. It doesn't happen right away. Satan would like us to think that if it doesn't happen right away, it doesn't happen at all. Man's days will be 120, so we're looking at the next guy. Well, wait a second, he's 600 years old. That's not right. Okay, give it time. He's patient with us. So when your prayer doesn't get answered right away, it's okay. It may not. Abraham's wasn't even open, or the promise to him wasn't answered during his lifetime. It's a thousand years later, but it'll happen. Okay, so once we come to Abraham and the genealogies, the genealogies come to an abrupt end, and we start to get more detail on Terah and Abram and Sarai. And this initiates what will unfold as God's plan to redeem the nations through one man, an offspring of Abram, and fulfillment of the prophecy in Genesis 12, 1 to 3. And that's the promise to Abraham. Okay, wrapping up. <clears throat> so we have after the fall and the downward spiral of man, we have to ask a question. Is there hope for mankind? God's answer is a resounding yes. We can't tell, we can't tell as we slog through the specifics of genealogies, but ultimately there is a destination and a hope to the story. By the end of Genesis 11, we see the beginning of God's plan for the rescue and the restoration of the nation. We started with a table of nations who worship the creation and their own creations rather than creator. And rather than destroying the world again, God showing incredible patience, disperses the masses and calls one man out of an idolatrous Chaldean culture. Genesis 12, Abram humbles his heart and responds to the call. And through Abram, God begins his plan to proclaim his glory and goodness to bless the nations. <clears throat> the reason we praise him today <clears throat> is because God kept his promise to Abram several thousand years ago to bless the nations. Most of us are not relatives of Peleg. So why are we blessed? Because from Noah through Shem to Arphaxad to Peleg to Abram and on to Christ and through Christ, we receive the same blessing. We who believe have been grafted in to that family line and the blessing. The genealogies we just looked at and those in Matthew and Luke combined with other New Testament scriptures are our verification. Paul said in 
Galatians 3, 7, therefore know that only those who are of faith, only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith preached the gospel to Abraham before saying, in you all the nations shall be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. So if you're a believer in Christ, then the, then the blessing that fell on Abraham falls on you, falls on you. And that makes all the difference. Let's pray. Lord, I just want to thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for your word, for, um, for stretching it, for showing us the forest through the trees, for showing us your plan. Um, and we just pray that the discussion groups will go well and, um, and that whatever you have for us, um, you would give to us in Jesus' name.